Good morning. Um, we have homework due today. I think I've seen most of you bring it up, but if you haven't brought it up, bring it up uh, either right now or after class. So the, really the next thing we have to do is prepare for the second exam. And before we start going over the practice exams, I just wanted to know if anybody has any questions about the exam that they wanted to bring up. Because that would be top priority. Yeah, I will get this homework graded somehow this weekend um, and uh, sit back to you so you can use it to study the exams on Wednesday. Okay, so let's go around. Let's start uh, uh, going over the practice exam. We'll start with practice exam 2A. Now, remember the short answer questions, pretty much all or nothing. Uh, I'm not expecting you to memorize a lot of numbers, but just like in the first uh, exam, Sometimes I want you to understand sort of order of magnitude values. So the refractory period of the squid action potential is approximately how much? And you're given four choices, 0 0.05 milliseconds, half a millisecond, five milliseconds, or 50 milliseconds. So what would that be? You guys got to help me out here. Yeah. 0 0.5. 0.5 is a little short for the refractory period. That's actually closer to how long it takes for the action potential to rise. But the refractory period is a time after the action potential that lasts a little longer. So it's the next higher one, 5 milliseconds. 0.5 would probably be the next most reasonable choice. But uh, remember that the refractory period is when the H gates close. Uh, after the action potential, and that H gate has a time constant that's on the order of a few milliseconds. So five milliseconds is sort of a ballpark figure for the refractory period. And you should know what the refractory period is, the time after an action potential when the, when the, uh, the, the axon is no longer excitable until it completely recovers back to rest. Okay. Problem two is really, I gave you a bunch uh, of equations last class that you need to know, and problem two is just asking you to write one of those down. Write the diffusion equation for the case when particles are neither created or destroyed. So what would the diffusion equation be? <coughs> if I ask for the diffusion equation, what's that going to look like? Which of those equations is it? is equal to d times the second spatial derivative. That's the diffusion equation. That's true if particles are not created or destroyed. If the problem has particles being created, you usually just add on another term here. Uh, and if that was the case, I would probably give you the equation. So I could conceivably give you the diffusion equation, but it is one of those equations that you're asked to remember. And d, then, is the diffusion constant. And you can just look at the equation, and you can see that d just to make the units have to work out right, uh, it has got to be meter squared to cancel that meter squared and over second to cancel to give you one over second time. So that's one of the basic equations that we studied. It's essentially the same as the heat equation uh, with just C changed into T for temperature. Okay, uh, now here's a three is another one of these problems where you're asking for uh, to know order of magnitude. I want to know what the osmolarity of blood is. And there's three choi or four choices there. What would be the osmolarity? Well, I guess you guys may not have the exam in front of you. 0 0.0003 milliosmol, 0 0.03 milliosmol, 3 milliosmol, or 300 milliosmol. 300 is the case. 150 millimolar sodium and 150 millimolar potassium, or excuse me, chlorine is sort of standard saline salt water. Uh, the hardest thing about this is it's easy to sort of remember it's 0.3 osmol, which is moles per liter. Um, but the answer has an M and up there in front, so it's milliosmol, so you want to check, pick the uh, 300. I guess 0 0.3 wasn't one of the choices, so that 
made it a little bit better. Okay, and finally, the short answer, the last one, is a little bit longer story here. A small, warm-blooded animal lives in the Arctic and stays warm by wrapping itself in a material that is a poor heat conductor. However, this material is also impervious to oxygen. In order to get oxygen, which must be by diffusion since the air is very still and the animal has no circulatory system, the animal must occasionally and briefly remove its wrapper and expose itself to the air. Will this system for breathing allow the animal to stay warm? So, it won't usually be this long-winded, but if you have this animal and it's trick, it's gonna suffocate if it doesn't open up its wrapper and breathe, but will it also now be able to stay warm? I'll give you a hint on this. Think back to the dolphin, which sort of has to do the same thing. The dolphin is wrapped in blubber, and it's under because it's swimming in the water, but it has to come up to the surface to breathe. And um, basically the question is, uh, it's not exactly the same, but somewhat similar. Is it going to be able to breathe air, exchange oxygen, and still stay warm? Anybody you saying no? Who says no? Raise their hand. Who says yes? Okay, the no's, the no's have it, uh, and it's the correct answer. Now the reason is basically the Lewis number, which we talked about. The Lewis number says uh, it's a ratio of, uh, it compares diffusion to um, to the convection, the diffusion of heat. And basically no heat diffuses, uh, uh, in, in air, heat and oxygen diffuse about the same rate, where, and in water, um, diffusion, uh, air actually, um, uh, heat diffuses faster than oxygen. So, presumably this animal is living in air. If you open your wrapper long enough to get oxygen by diffusion, you're going to inevitably get heat by diffusion also. So uh, it's really a case of, in order for this to work, you would have to have a Lewis number uh, that was of a size that it, you could transport uh, oxygen but not heat. If you had that, then you'd be in good shape, which is somewhat the case in uh, now, even, even in the uh, countercurrent example we looked at, you could transport heat faster than oxygen. So you really have to have some kind of weird material where uh, the diffusion is so poor compared to the diffusion of heat that, uh, yeah. Okay, so those are the four short answer. Now let's go and try one of these uh, Problems. There's going to be three problems, 25 points each. And here the problem says a patient has a damaged kidney is undergoing dialysis. So we talked a bit about uh, dialysis uh, and artificial kidney. And the procedure starts at time zero, and it has uh, you're looking at the uh, concentration of the urea in the patient's blood, and it gives you some funny unit, but the unit's not so important. The data is T and C, 0, 1, 2, 3, 52, 14.9, 4.3, and 1.2. And you're assuming, it says to assume a time dependence, which is an exponential. A constant E to the minus T over tau. And they want you to determine the time constant and the half-life. Okay, you're given some semi-log paper. And you could plot the data on the semi-log the, on the semi -like paper just to convince yourself that this actually matched the exponential. If you do that, it does. You're not actually asked to plot the solution on the paper, so it's just uh, helpful. But if you were asked, you ought to be comfortable plotting things on log-log and semi-log paper. Now, how could you go about and find tau? What would be... Uh, I'll give you one hint. This does follow very closely an exponential, so you don't have to worry a lot about noise. So what would you do if you were faced with finding tau in this problem? Take a ratio. Take a ratio. Okay, you got a choice of what data points? 0, 52, 3, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4
the, this one and this one. You can get the same answer no matter which points you take. So we're going to take C is, uh, let's see, so C will be in case 1, 52 equals C naught E to the minus 0 over tau. And you want to take 1.2 equals C naught E to the minus 3 over tau. You take the ratio, this will be 5.2 over 1.2 equals, the C naughts cancel, this is just 1, because e to the 0 is 1, e to the minus 3 over tau. This point, you got to solve for tau, you could take the reciprocal of both sides, 1.2 over 5.2 equals e to the minus 3 over tau, and what to do at the next step? Take the natural log. So I'm going to take the natural log of 1.2 over 5.2 equals the natural log. We'll cancel out the exponential minus 3 over tau. Now at this point you might be a little worried. What's this minus sign doing in there? But this is the number less than 1, so the log is going to come out to be minus. So 1.2 divided by 5.2 gives you a 0.23, and I take the logarithm of it, and you get a minus 1.466 equals minus 3 over tau. Cancels and minus signs, yes? I'm interested in 52 now. Uh, 52. So what you're saying is I should erase that and erase that. And now did I... 1.2 divided by 52 is 0 0.0 log... Uh, divided by 52 log is minus, thank you, it makes a big difference, doesn't it? Minus, something looks wrong, uh, 3.1.2 divided by 52 equals, number logarithm, minus 3.769. Okay. Now let's calculate tau, which is going to be 3 over this thing. 3 divided by 3.769 is 0 0.7959. I'm just going to call it 0 0.8. The two significant figures, that's correct. And if you look back at the problem, these are in units of hours. You know, it's always useful at a point like this to kind of just do a, uh, a check. And you say to yourself, well, each time step, this falls by, you know, about a factor of four, maybe a little less, three and a half. Well, the time constant corresponds when it falls by a factor of e, or one over e, which would be about one third. So this falls by a little more than one third, so you ought to get something a little bit less than one time step, a little bit less than one hour, and yes, what do we get? Yeah. Since um, since this wasn't one of the equations we um, that came up at the end of the class yesterday, mm -hmm. the other day, is that going to be given on the exam? This. Um, this was this was given in the practice exam. Assume a time dependence of, and I specifically have the equation here. Okay. So, uh, so yes, that will be given if, it's, if it comes up. Okay, you aren't asked to get C0, but it's real easy to get C0 because you're given data at t equals 0, so e, that's 1. So C0 is just 52 if you were asked for it. But you are asked for the half-life. How do you get the half-life? So C equal to 1 half C0. Yeah, you can, you can, one of two ways. You can remember that the half-life is 0 0.693 times tau, in which case you multiply this times 0 0.693 and you get 0 0.55 hours. But that's another equation and that one wasn't given. So what do you do if you don't remember that relationship? You go back to this equation and you say, the, what is the half-life? It's the time it takes to fall from its initial value, C0, to half of that value. So you can write C0 over 2, that's half of the value, 
is z0, and you're now finding the half-life, because that's what over tau, which is essentially, I think, what you were saying. And then these cancel, and you get, uh, let's take the reciprocal of both sides, 2 is equal to e to the plus t one half over tau, where I took the reciprocal, changed that minus to plus, and that 2 came up there. Take the log. What you'll end up getting is that t one half is equal to log of 2 times tau. Log of 2 is just your 0.693. So that is uh, another way to do it if you didn't memorize this expression. So I don't want it to all be all about memorization. Sometimes you can speed things up if you do remember it. And again, look at this. This is going to be 0.693 times uh, 0.8 is t one half. Is, it comes out to be about 0 0.55. Well, that's what we have up here. If you look here, well, it falls by almost a factor of four going from each time, each hour. So a half-life ought to be, a four is two squared, a half-life ought to be somewhere around half an hour. So it's always useful to think, you know, one of, the, one of the mantras of the class, think before you calculate, I look at this data and just guess what the half-life is, sort of make a reasonable guess. So then you can check your answer. If you get three hours or you get, you get uh, 55 hours, you move a decimal point or something, it's immediately going to say, oh my gosh, can't be right. Because as you probably noticed from the grading on the homework in the last exam, if you give me an answer, then maybe it has a small mathematical mistake, but it's such that your answer is a factor of a thousand off. I tend to take off more points than if you give me a small mathematical mistake that makes your answer a factor of, you know, 20% off. Uh, it's a big difference. Okay, so that problem a little bit related to uh, dialysis. It also harkens back to chapter two, uh, where we were talking about the exponential. Uh, but uh, in dialysis, it tends to be an exponential type of behavior that uh, happens when you're undergoing the dialysis. Okay. Questions before we move on? All right. Let us try another one. Uh, calcium enters a spherical cell of radius 5 uh, microns through calcium channels in the cell membrane. So here's your cell. There's little calcium channels here, and the whole cell has a radius of 5 microns. And uh, estimate how long is needed for the calcium to diffuse to the cell center. So calcium comes in, and then it has to, it enters the cell through the membrane, and then it has to diffuse down to the cell center, and are, you're given the diffusion constant for calcium in the cytosol, cytoplasm, that's 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second. So that's for calcium. So remember, the diffusion constant depends on what molecule you're looking at. Great big proteins diffuse really slowly, calcium's fairly fast. How would you go about solving this? How do you find the amount of time? Because suppose the calcium has to do something to the nucleus. It really has to diffuse in to the nucleus. What kind of time delays does that uh, cause? So what are we dealing with here? What, what, what do you do? Use Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just trying to get uh, a variety of people contributing. Go ahead. So we just use the diffusion in one dimension. Okay. I would assume that. All right. I would say one dimension, three dimensions. So what would you get with one dimension? Um, I can't remember the equation, but okay. the square root of 2 dt, I think. Uh, okay, square root 2 dt, and what's that equal to? Oh, that uh, equals to the distance. Right? It's equals to the distance. So in one dimension, it'd be x. Now, the whole question is whether you should use one dimension or whether this is more of a three-dimensional problem because it's a sphere, which would make that a six. And the answer is, I would take either one. I've, I've told you to memorize the 1D case. That's the one I'm really expecting you to use. If you use six, I'd say, boy, you're even smarter than I thought. I'd take that also. 
All right, so uh, so that's the good news. Is that I'm really not going to be testing you on the difference between 1 and 3D in this case. But what you're asked for is time. So you just solve that for the time. x squared over 2D is the time. And now all you got to do is put in the numbers. And the key now is just to make sure you do the units right. So this would be. 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second uh, squared. Oops, that's not. That's the units is um, the distance. This is distance on top. 5 microns. 5 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared over 2 times d. 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 9 meters squared over second. Now here's a place where people make a surprisingly large number of mistakes. Is if you're squaring this, you get 25 is 5 squared, but you also when you square this, you get 10 to the minus 12 there. So squaring the exponential is like multiplying the uh, the exponent by two. Divided by this is 0.5 and this is two, so that's just going to give you 10 to the minus nine. So this actually works out to be 25 times 10 to the uh, minus 3. And that would be meter squared cancels the meter squared and the second comes up. So you could just say that that is 25. Uh, uh, oh, I, in, the, in the answer sheet, I used the 6 instead of the 2 for 3D. But uh, basically, this gives us 25 milliseconds, which is actually kind of a surprisingly long time. It says that if stuff comes into the cell membrane, and then it's got to diffuse all the way to the center of the cell, that takes a while. I mean, it depends on what you compare this to. But if you're comparing it to an action potential duration, uh, sodium comes into the cell, and to have that sodium then diffuse through the whole cell, uh, it would take probably something similar, several milliseconds at least, as opposed to the actual potential that might be over in one millisecond. So it, it gives you a useful idea of how the time scales involved in these problems. So uh, that is uh, the problem about diffusion here. And I, like I said, in the answer sheet, I say I'll give full credit if you use two or six. All right, yes? We assume that charge is not a factor. Um, yeah, and that's exactly the kind of question. This does say uh, how long is needed for the calcium to diffuse to the cell center. So that's a, a key that I'm not asking you for how long it would take to be pulled in by electric forces. But if you had uncertainty, that would certainly be the type of question you could ask me during the exam. And that's the type of answer I would give. I would say, no, ignore charge. This is diffusion. Uh, so you can always ask me questions. If you, uh, if you ask me a question, I can't remember this equation, I'll probably just tell you, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. But if it's more of a, uh, explaining the setup of the problem and, and, and understanding the problem, I will try to answer those. All right? OK, so problem seven. So probably there will be some of the longer questions that are fairly short and easy like this, and some of them that are more long-winded. Uh, they're all worth the same, so if you see a short one, you may want to bang that one out first. Problem seven is about Hodgkin-Huxley model. And Hodgkin-Huxley used an experimental experiment called voltage clamp. And I'm going to go on, it goes on and on and on here. Let me, first of all, this equation is written down. I have some subscripts that are a little different than what you had in class. I use the subscript M for membrane, and sometimes I leave those off just to make life a little easier, but H, uh, B, M minus, and I use the E instead of a B for the sodium nurse potential. Uh, some papers use E, some papers use V. Uh, I will try to make sure the exam is consistent with our notation, but this practice exam was slightly different. And again, it's exactly the kind of question, if you have it, uh, 
if you're saying what's the difference between E and B and the nurse potential, certainly that's the kind of question I can help you with on the exam. All right, now what's being asked? It says that you are, uh, uh, question A, we're going to try to understand qualitatively how the sodium potassium current and their sum uh, change as a function of time for various experiments. So experiment number one has the current. I believe I give you a little graphs up here. Uh, the current and the voltage. This is the clamp voltage. Remember what voltage clamp is. You start off at rest and at some time you clamp the voltage and in part A you clamp it up to 10 millivolts and then you hold it. And the question is, what is the current? Qualitatively, so you don't even need to put numbers on this axis. What I want to know is qualitatively how this looks. So, who's going to help me out here? Uh, what's the current look like? Well, so over here. Anybody? What's the, what's the sodium current going to look like? I will tell you that the problem says you can ignore the brief capacitive current, right, when the current's charged. So here it's zero because it's at rest. There would be a big capacitive spike, but the problem says we don't have to worry about it. What's the sodium current look like? Anybody? I forget it dips down. Okay. You're going to have, immediately M's going to open up. And when M opens up, H is already open at rest. You get sodium rushing in, and that's usually represented by a downward current. And because of this inconsistency with the actual Hodgkin Huxley paper and everybody else in the world about the sign convention, if you want, uh, if you've made your sodium currents go up and potassium is going down, I'd probably accept it. But the best thing to do is to label them so that I know which is which. This is a sodium current. It turns on. And then what does it do? It's off when it reached the uh, hertz. Uh, With H closes. As H closes, it turns off. So there's a the sodium. Potassium. <coughs> potassium is going to be going uh, out because you're up there at 10 millivolts. But it's slow. So it turns on slowly in a sort of sigmoidal way. It comes up like that. And the sum is just adding these two. So the sum is going to come to look something like that. That's the total current that you see in the experiment. So that's actually what you'd measure. You'd have to do some other additional experiment, like, like replacing, getting rid of the sodium in the bath or something in order to measure these individually. But the experiment would give you this kind of curve. But that was just problem A. Problem B had you do the same thing, except we're going to change from plus 10. Oh, I might as well do that on a separate picture. We're going to go up to plus 50 millivolts. How would the picture change? What does the sodium current now look like? Let me read something that's in the problem because I didn't want you to have to memorize what the parameters are. Assume the inert potential for sodium is plus 50 millivolts and the inert potential for potassium is minus 75. Now what's the sodium current look like? Great line, why? It actually goes right to the nurse potential of sodium. And you have V minus VNA, and since V is VNA, you have zero. So you get straight line for the sodium. That's, in fact, one way you can determine the nurse potential. Okay. Um, and the potassium? What's potassium going to look like? More drastic slope when no it increases, but like same shape. Yeah, it's basically the same shape. It's just a little bit higher because you're 
because this is even farther from EK, so it's a little bit larger, but it's pretty much the same shape. And so that's potassium, and the sum is also this, just the potassium in this case. So if you did the experiment, you'd see just the potassium curve. And finally, part C has you going all the way up to from rest to 90 millivolts. And now, 90 minus 50, it's a positive number, so all of a sudden your sodium current becomes positive. When the sodium channel opens, instead of having sodium rush in, sodium rushes out. It still wants to diffuse in, but the electrical forces, because of the high potential inside, dominate, and you have current, sodium current going out. So the sodium current would look like that, and it still turn off. The potassium current would look more or less the same, but even higher. And the sum would look like something like that, with a, a little notch in it, where the sodium turns on, turns off, and the potassium. So you want to be familiar with the voltage clamp. Yes? So you said it'd be like the same, like if we were to um, switch the positive and negative, like if the K was on the bottom on the top one and the sodium on the top and the K potassium. If, if you switched it. all the directions of these, so your curves look like the mirror image flipped over, yeah. and I would probably accept it, especially if you said I'm using the Hodgkin-Huxley sign convention, then I would absolutely accept it if you switch them all over. If you switch them all around, but you didn't say you're using Hodgkin-Huxley sign convention, I would probably still accept it. I might take off one point because I'd say something like it's ambiguous what your sign convention is. But uh, you know, I know I gave you the Hodgkin-Huxley paper, and I realized that the Hodgkin-Huxley plots didn't. They look, tended to look like these with these flipped over. So I don't want to uh, then penalize you for reading carefully the Hodgkin Huxley paper. So, but if you do this one flipped over and then this one writes this side up and you're inconsistent with yourself, that's where you get into trouble. And, and I'd start taking the points off. So this kind of problem is a little hard to grade because it's so qualitative. But I want you to understand things at a qualitative level. So. So it's important. Would you expect us to point the time scale with when each channel opens? Or? Um, when if I say plot qualitatively, I probably wouldn't worry too much about the time scale, as you'll see when you get the answer sheet, which I will send out after Monday's class. I didn't put a time scale on my plots in the answer sheet. So it's not a bad idea to put a plot time scale on the plot, but you're better off putting no time scale than putting a drastically wrong time scale. Uh, uh, so you'll have to decide. If I said quantitatively, it'd be a little bit different story, and I'd really want to see a time scale on the plot. OK, essay question time. Um, what is anode break excitation? Explain how and why this type of excitation occurs. So what is anode break? One thing would be nice if you tell me what it means by anode and what it means by break would be a good place to start. What do I mean by anodal excitation? Well, in general, the anode hyperpolarizes the cell. So if you're stimulating to drive the cell below rest in our usual sign convention, that would be an anodal stimulus, whereas you're stimulating to drive it above rest, like at these voltage clamp experiments, you're, you're going to be, it's more cathodal or depolarizing. What does the break mean? What do we mean by break? I'll pick on you. What do you, do you remember what, what it means to be the break stimulation as opposed to a normal stimulation? Um, okay, not really. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to, to not know it today. You want to know it Wednesday. Um, anybody else? 
Wasn't it uh, that it was hyperpolarized? It was trying to go back to the resting of the brain and it overshoots and it causes it to. That's exactly what happens, yes. That's not why we call it break, but that does what after the breakout. Break makes basically means it, it, it excites the action potential after the end of the stimulus. The break. You turn the stimulus on, and then when the stimulus ends or breaks, that is when you then get an action potential. And it makes a difference because if you stimulate it like with a stimulus pulse as a function of time, that let's go out and down for, for analyl. You stimulate it here, and then you looked at the response, you get an action potential right after the break. And if you stimulate it with a longer one, the action potential would be delayed because that break moved over. Even though they started at the same time, they ended at the different times, so and the action potential is delayed. So it happens after the end of the action potential. And you can do test that experimentally by just varying the width of the action potential and seeing if the stimulus, if the stimulus fired be, after you turn the stimulus on, you get a stimulus here, and you get the same stimulus here, and it would not be break. But if it stimulates when you turn the stimulus off, it would follow the end of the stimulus pulse. Okay, so then we go to what you just said, is that after the end, so here's V as a function of time, here's your stimulus turns on, sitting at rest, you hyperpolarize and it holds down here, hyperpolarization, here you turn the stimulus off. Uh, I should, this, this would be the stimulus would turn off here, so off, break. It starts heading back to rest, but like you said, it overshoots rest. Why does it overshoot rest? Yeah, the potassium current has, uh, how do I say this? I want to make sure I say it correctly. The potassium current was actually turned off by the hyperpolarization. Potassium end gate opens upon depolarization, so it closes with hyperpolarization. So your potassium current's so smaller. Your leak is just what it always is, a leak. Rust is usually a competition between leak and potassium. Potassium's lower, leak sort of upper, upper. If you turn the potassium off, it's like the leak potential now becomes the rust potential. The leak potential is up here somewhere, and it's high enough that it could trigger the positive feedback that fires the action potential. So it comes basically from turning off, suppressing the potassium current. <clears throat> and, and remember, the potassium end gate's really slow, so it takes a long time for that to turn on. It has time to get back up here to, to the rest, to fire the action potential before end can really sufficiently recover to make that potassium very important. So, the other thing historically that's important about anode break is that um, when Hodgkin Huxley were building their model, this was a weird little result that is sort of unexpected and hard to explain, and yet their model, which wasn't based on anode break at all, managed to explain anode break very nicely. So it was good evidence that their model was on the right track. So that would be practice exam 2A. So it took us 40 minutes, take you guys maybe a little longer. Um, so time, just like in the first exam, could be an issue. Uh, it was, for some of you are still here at the end of the class. Try to look through the exam really quickly and figure out where you can uh, best use your time. For instance, if I was doing this exam, I'd bang through the short answers, then I'd say, you know, problem six about the calcium. That looks really small, and I think I know exactly what to do. I'd bang that out, boom, and then get that done. And then I'd say, okay, five and seven, I'm going to have to think a little bit more and spend your time doing those and maybe get to the essay at the end. All right. We got three of these, and we, had, we can get started on 2B. Um, but were there any questions while I'm erasing all this? Let me know if you have any general questions about the exam. On that practice exam, we saw a question on diffusion. That's like chapter four. We saw a question on um, erasing. That's on bioelectricity, which is uh, chapter six. There could be a question from chapter five. In fact, the dialysis question was sort of chapter five. 
because uh, we talked about dialysis there. So those are the th four, three chapters in the main topics. Okay, practice exam 2B, short answers. So uh, I want you guys just to yell out the solution when I read the problem. In the Hodgkin-Huxley model, which gates are slow and which are fast? And your change choices are M, H, and N. Which of those are slow? N? Any other? H. N and H. And then that leaves M to be fast. So just keep in mind, M is the fast one, half a millisecond. H and N are both more like several milliseconds. They're the slow ones. So if you, if you keep that in mind, you got, you're, you're well, well ahead of the game. Okay. In the squid nerve axon, the upstroke of the action potential is caused by what ion entering the membrane? The upstroke, when it goes from rest up to 50. Sodium. Sodium. That's the sodium. If I asked you which one's responsible for the rest potential, it'd probably be, it'd be potassium. Also the leak, but potassium of the two. Uh, but sodium is what is underlies that upstroke. So that's really important to remember. Uh, in fact, you could say that that was Hodgkin Huxley's biggest contribution, even before the paper I gave you, is they figured out, they were the ones who figured out that it's sodium that's responsible for the upstroke. Before they came along, people thought that the membrane just opened up and it went to zero. That's why depolarized means to lose its current or lose its polarization. But Hodgkin Huxley in their earlier experiments actually found that it went past zero and went up to plus 50. How do you explain that? It has to be sodium with the sodium there's potential. Okay, when the equation, uh, when using the equation for heat conduction, equivalent to the diffusion equation, must temperature be given in Kelvin or can Celsius be used? Do we need Kelvin or can we use Celsius? Yes. I would say you can use Celsius. You can. Do you know why? Uh, yeah, because the difference between Kelvin and Celsius is the same. The number is the same. Uh -huh. And what is it about the diffusion equation that means that, that what, what, is, what about the diffusion equation makes you think that you can ignore that constant shift? Um, because you have the change in temperature with respect to time. Just, okay. It's not squared, but that's what I mean. So okay. it's just a change. It's just, and in particular, it's derivatives. Derivatives mean differences. And so if you're taking a derivative, a, con a constant, the derivative of a constant is zero. So if any time you have derivatives or differences, T hot minus T cold, then um, you can use Celsius, and they're going to give you the same result as Kelvin. What's a case where you can't use Celsius? In particular, like the, Boltzmann constant. the Boltzmann constant and the Boltzmann factor is one classic case, but that's from chapter three. Can you think of any case from chapters four through six where you'd get in trouble if you used uh, Celsius? I can think of two. Osmotic pressure. osmotic pressure. The osmotic pressure, which is very similar to the ideal gas law, says that osmotic pressure is gas constant uh, uh, concentration times the gas constant times T. In that case, you have to use Kelvin. There's no derivatives, no differences. If you use Celsius, you'll get a drastically wrong result. And the other case that I can think of, uh, I have a case in mind. What was it? Uh, ah, the inertia potential. If you wanted, say, the inertia potential of sodium, you're going to get the KT over Q log of the concentration changes. There, T has to be in Kelvin or your you're doomed. So in those cases, must use absolute temperature. Anytime you have the C D T or T1 minus T2 or anything like that, you can use Celsius or you can use Kelvin. It doesn't matter, but uh, there's no need to use Kelvin. All right. 
Another one of these questions where I want you to know order of magnitude, how big some of these things are. The length constant for a typical nerve axon is closer to, and now I give these differences by a factor of 100. So uh, 0 0.01 millimeter, 1 millimeter, 100 millimeter, or 10,000 millimeters, which would be 10 meters, which is like across the room. One. One millimeter is what we found when we were looking at the table equation. And you know, it can vary from nerve to nerve, but it doesn't vary by factors of 100. All nerves are sort of on the order of millimeters for distances and milliseconds for time constants. Okay, those are the four short answer. Let us go on now. Question about the cable equations. Um, Axon has a length 2L and the center of the x equals to 0. I always like to have a picture just because it helps me think about things. So it's going to be x equal L to x equal to minus L. And um, you have an electrode at each end of the axon that maintains the potential. And at the this end, it's going to keep it at V0. And at this end, it also keeps it at V0. So here's the way to think about this. Suppose you wanted to do a voltage clamp experiment, but you were using a nerve that you couldn't stick an electrode down like Hodgkin Huxley did. But you could stick two microelectrodes in it. You might stick the microelectrode here and here. And you want to keep the voltage constant. And really what we're asking now is how effective will you be in keeping the voltage constant along this axon? That's really what this question is trying to get at. So let's see. Um, Okay, so it says, note, the potential is the same at both ends. Then I give you the cable equation. It was one of the equations that uh, I said you had to memorize, but being a nice guy, I gave it to you in this problem anyway, uh, because this problem's a little long-winded, and I thought I didn't want to make it even harder by, by forcing you to memorize it. But you really should know this equation which looks just like the diffusion equation, except you have the added term. OK, where lambda is the length constant and tau is the time constant. So find an expression for the steady state transmembrane potential distribution. Steady state, key word to watch for. What's steady state mean? No change in what? Space? Time. Steady state means no change in time. We throw away the time derivative. So that term now goes away. So let's just do a little eraser math. And I'll move the V still there. So now we get this expression it is really the expression that we're solving. So watch for the word steady state. That will often mean that your life just became much simpler than it had been originally. OK, now I give you a guess. I will usually give you a guess if I ask you to try to solve a differential equation. So I'll give you a guess here. A e to the minus x over lambda plus b e to the x over lambda plus c. Uh, basically, I won't be asking you to come up with a guess, even though this is a very very understandable guess, because the solution to this differential equation, what gives you two derivatives, gives you something proportional to the function itself, is exponential, is either plus or minus. There's two solutions, because there is a second derivative. This could be thought of as a total derivative now instead of a partial. I added a constant in, because you can always add a constant into a differential equation, just to see what happens. OK, so now you're supposed to solve for B, you're supposed to basically find what A, B, and C are and figure out uh, what those are so you get an expression for B of X. So what do you do now? Plug it in to the other let's, equation. Let's plug this in. If we're going to plug it in, we get lambda squared, and now we have to differentiate this twice with respect to X. Well, here you still have an A. Derivative of exponential is derivative. That you got to know. So you get two derivatives. You're going to get two minus signs, so you get plus. And you're going to, by the chain rule, you're going to have two of these lambda squares. And you get your exponential back. Same thing with, he, with this term. Two derivatives of b. 
is going to give you a B, two factors of lambda in the denominator from the chain rule, and your exponential back. What do you get when you take two derivatives of C? It's a constant. You get nothing. So that goes down, and that's equal to just B. So A e to the minus x over lambda plus B e to the x over lambda plus C. Well, now, notice this is kind of nice. The lambda squared is canceled, the lambda squared there and there. What does this tell us? C equals zero. We learn one thing. This has to be true at all x. So we've got f, the decaying exponentials are the same, but they are the same. They both have an a. The rising exponentials are the same, but they are the same. They're both a b. C has a constant. There's no constant term on this side. So all we learn from this is c equals 0. So I didn't have to throw in the constant, but I did. Um, so there you have c equals to 0. And now we still left with a, I like to kind of rewrite the guess using what I learned, and no c. So we're not done yet. We still need a and b. How are we going to get a and b? Okay, we'll plug in L for x, and what's V equal at x equal to L? V zero. V zero equals A, and x is now minus L over lambda, plus B E to the L over lambda. That's one equation, but there's two unknowns, so what else are we going to do? Plug in the other boundary. Plug in the other boundary. So it's also V zero there. And that's at x equals the minus L. So the minus L will cancel that minus sign and give you e to the L over lambda plus b e to the minus L over lambda. And you have two equations for two unknowns that will allow you to solve for a and b. OK. Now, if you were doing this problem and you got to this point, You've gone through, plugged it in, found c equals 0, applied the boundary conditions, you get at least half the credit. Half the credit for the part of the problem that says solve. But you ought to be able to solve two equations and two unknowns. So I'm going to go ahead and do that with you guys just so you can see how it's done. Um, but at this point, what you learned in, in high school algebra, two equations and two unknowns, is how you solve for a and b. What I like to do is uh, I mean, you can do it in a variety of ways. I want to say get rid of the b's. So I want to get rid of, I'll multiply by 1 over e to the l over lambda. In other words, I'll multiply both this equation by e to the minus l over lambda all the way through. I'll multiply this equation by e to the plus l over lambda. That's going to give me just b's here. And then I can subtract the two equations and the b's will go away. So I'm going to get, I need some more space. I'm going to get v naught e to the minus l over lambda equals a e to the minus l over lambda minus l over lambda is minus 2l over lambda. And this becomes plus b times 1. This one, I get v naught e to the l over lambda equals a e to the l over lambda and l over lambda e to the 2l over lambda plus b. And I subtract the two. V naught is e to the minus L over lambda minus e to the L over lambda equals, these two both have a, e to the minus 2L over lambda minus e to the 2L over lambda. That minus is really down here. So you can solve immediately for a and you get a is equal to a complicated expression, e to the minus l over lambda minus e to the l over lambda divided by e to the minus 2l over lambda minus e to the 2l over lambda. And that would be your expression for a. And you can do the same thing for b. And I won't go through and do the whole thing for b, but if you multiply by e to the plus l over lambda, 
here, that would just give you a, e to the minus L over lambda through here, that would just give you a, subtract the two, you get rid of a, you can solve for b. You get a very similar expression. Yes? Can you say a equals b because you said the b naught equal to each other, and you say that e to the negative, that they have the same coefficient, they're going to be equal? Um, that's, this is, remember, that argument works when you have x, and it has to be true at all x. But this case, it's only, these are only true at the boundaries. So you can't say that all the e to the minus things have to be 0, because it doesn't have to be true for all x. So it's a little, kind of a subtle point. If you had, if you had something like e to the minus x over lambda, uh, times a equals or plus a bunch of other stuff. And then over here you had b e to the minus x over lambda plus a bunch of other stuff that didn't have the decaying exponential. You'd say, okay, this has to be true at all x. So all these other terms you know, uh, don't depend on the decaying exponential. They may be linear in x, they may be constants. They don't matter. I have to have a equals b. But if, it's, if this is an x, if this is just a constant l, then you can't make that argument that, that oh, everything, all these other terms don't matter because it only has to be true at that one spot. So you have to go through and solve it with the linear equations. That's the way I would answer that question. If you look in the answer sheet, you actually don't see this expression. And I'll show you why. There's a simplification you can make. Whether you call this a simplification or not, it's up to you. Uh, this is e to the minus L over lambda minus e to the L over lambda. And I wrote the bottom as e to the minus L over lambda minus e to the L over lambda times e to the minus L over lambda plus e to the L over lambda. Let's see if that works. There's e to the minus L over lambda times e to the minus L over lambda. It gives you that term. This cross term with a plus cancels that cross term with a minus, and this is the minus e to the 2L over lambda. So it really works, and the nice thing is it cancels that and that, and you just get v naught over e to the L over lambda plus e to the minus L over lambda. So it's a little simpler expression, but it's not something you might see immediately. So if you give me this, I'd give you full credit. If you give me this, I'll say, boy, you really like to simplify stuff. We're, we're, we're kindred spirits. <laughs> OK, and if you work it out then, you do the same thing for b, and you solve this. The final expression, which you're asked for, is v of x, is v naught e to the x over lambda plus e to the minus x over lambda divided by e to the l over lambda plus e to the minus l over lambda. You can see it here. This is a. It's got the thing in the denominator and just a 1, or v naught, and then a 1 at top. And a times the positive exponential. And if you work it out for b, you get exactly the same thing. So you add the b times the negative exponential. So this is your final solution for the voltage, which is what you're asked for, at least in part a. This is kind of a long-winded problem. OK. At this point, what I like to do is I like to ask myself, you know, did I make a mistake? How can I check? Well, one way I could check is I can check, at least check my boundary conditions. If x was equal to l, then you get the numerator would be exactly the same as the denominator, and you just get v0. If x was equal to minus l, you get a minus l over lambda here, and you have a plus l over lambda, but they're plus, so you can switch their order you get 1, you get v0. It really works for the boundary conditions. So it's kind of slick uh, the way that, that happens. OK, part B. We've got enough time to finish this one. Use the approximation e to the x. You know, I just use z here. There's 1 plus z for small z. So really, I'd like you to remember that. But if you don't, uh, it's not gonna, I, I'd give it to you. So I'm going to erase this so I can finish the problem. Anybody have any questions on this before I erase it? Okay. <coughs>
is the most interesting problem, part of the problem isn't happened yet, and that is we got to go back and figure out whether this gave a decent voltage clamp or not. So we're going to use this approximation. Uh, so we're going to say what happens when the length constant is basically bigger than the length of the axon. Okay, so we can get an expression for V of X. And that's going to have a 1 plus X over lambda plus 1 minus X over lambda. That's just using this Taylor series. And I'll do the same thing downstairs. 1 plus L over lambda plus 1 minus L over lambda. And that says these cancel and these cancel. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 1 is 2. You just get V0. So it does a pretty good job on holding it constant, at least to this approximation. It holds it nice and constant. Now, if you used your, if you used a, a expression that goes out to the square in the Taylor series, so this wasn't asked in the problem. But if you use this, and you just took the first three terms, you could actually find that there is a little bit of droop in the potential right at the center. So here it's V naught. At this end, here it's V naught at minus L, L. But you could calculate, and you find this actually looks a little bit like a parabola, but there's a tiny bit of droop, and you can estimate how much of that droop is there. And it give you an idea of how, how effective your voltage clamp really is. But the problem didn't really ask that. So you could just say, well, with this approximation of the first two terms, it's a really good voltage clamp, as long as the length constant is big compared to the length of the axon. If the length constant gets small, then you definitely get droops, and it gives you the droopy droops like this. And you're, that's if lambda is really small compared to L. And it's a horrible voltage clamp. What else is there in this problem? Um, and uh, plot, oh, well, that's, that's essentially this is part C plot V of X in the two cases, and you could make that a perfectly straight line, or you could have a little droop, and then this is the case when the length constant is really small. So, if you're doing voltage clamping, this gives you an idea, and you want to know how close do I have to have these two electrodes in order to do a decent voltage clamp, you have to have them close compared to the length constant. Length constants are on the order of a millimeter. So you better put your two electrodes, you know, 100 microns apart or something. Well, that's about where we're going to get to today. So for next class, we have the rest of exam 2B and exam 2C to work through. We'll get through as much as we can. I'll give you the solutions to these after class on Monday. If you came in late and you haven't turned in your homework, bring it up right up here up front. I will see you all on Monday. Have a good weekend.